Hi there, I'm Gus Pham, and welcome to the Gus Pham The Chemistry Man Show, a cool chemistry show that reveals the scientific truth on how our world really works. Today on the show, we are going to get small, real small, and examine one of the smallest forms of matter in the world, atoms. Our universe is composed of atoms, in which these atoms all hold their own specific properties. But what I'm more interested in is the slightly bigger picture, the elements. Elements, found in everything around us, truly make up our world and so we needed something to document all of them. Well, luckily for us, these elements are organized into what's called a periodic table of elements, a nifty table composed of all the elements in the universe. The elements are organized in ascending order of atomic number and molar mass. They are also put into groups and periods, but I wonder why the elements are organized in this way. Is there any other trend than how periods contain the same number of principal energy levels, or that groups are elements with the same number of valence electrons? If only I could figure out if there were other trends. Hi there, I'm Ellen Lee, the chemistry fairy, and I can help you. Come with me! Where are we? This is a secret chemistry fairy hideout where all the magic happens. Ahem, I mean chemistry. Well, as you can clearly tell, the elements, although they are listed in terms of molar mass, actually follow trends too, which makes the periodic table even cooler. So, I'll start off with the most basic one, nuclear charge. Nuclear charge is basically the relative strength of the nucleus based on the number of protons. We can apply this to the periodic table, as when you go across the period, the number of protons increases, indicating the increase of the nuclear charge. Furthermore, the same concept works down a group, since protons are also being added. Therefore, the atomic number of an element dictates its nuclear charge, because the atomic number indicates how many protons there are in the nucleus. However, this is just the nuclear charge. What we truly want to look at is the effective nuclear charge, which is the amount of attraction exerted on valence electrons by the nucleus. The trend for the effective nuclear charge surprisingly deals with the numbers of protons as well as the core electrons. The effective nuclear charge is important because chemistry occurs at the valence electrons, and the amount of force felt by the valence electrons has large consequences for the atom's properties, which will be explained later. Core electrons have a huge effect on the force exerted on the valence electrons, known as shielding. Shielding is a repelling effect that the inner electrons have on the outer electrons. The electrons are not stationary and are in constant motion in what is called an orbital. So repulsion is felt in all directions resulting in a decrease in the amount of attraction felt by the valence electrons from the nuclear charge, or the nucleus. The more electron shells there are, the greater the shielding effect experienced by the outermost electrons. Now we'll look at the trends of the effective nuclear charge. If we go across the period from left to right, protons are being added, which makes nuclear charge increase. As protons are added, electrons are added as well, but these electrons are being added into the same energy level. Thus, there is no newfound shielding. Therefore, just like nuclear charge, effective nuclear charge also increases across a period. However, contrasting to nuclear charge, effective nuclear charge decreases down a group. Although more protons are being added and nuclear charge increases, the core electrons shield the valence electrons from the effect of the nucleus because there are more energy levels, hence decreasing the effective nuclear charge when going down a group. There is a general formula that we can use to calculate effective nuclear charge, which is effective nuclear charge equals to Z, nuclear charge referring to the number of protons, minus S, a value referring to the amount of repulsions experienced by any one valence electron. S depends on two things. Number one, if the valence electron penetrates the orbital of core electrons, which reduces the effect of repulsion because the valence electrons are closer to the nucleus or number two, the amount of repulsions between the valence electrons. This increases the effect of repulsion because the electrons will now be further from the nucleus. As explained before, S is very hard to calculate and using the number of core electrons for the value of S is not completely accurate. Now let's do two examples with the assumption that S is the number of inner core electrons. Starting off with lithium, elemental lithium has three protons and two inner core electrons, as we can tell by the Bohr diagram. So Z is 3 and S is 2. 3 minus 2 equals 1, and therefore the effective nuclear charge of lithium is approximately 1 with the assumption of S. Now fluorine. Elemental fluorine has 9 protons and 2 core electrons, the same as lithium. 9 minus 2 equals 7, and therefore the effective nuclear charge of fluorine is approximately 7 with the assumption of S. That's so cool! But are there any other trends in the periodic table? 
Yes, there should be, but I can't think of any right now. I'll call my trusty buddy over to come help us. I had somebody call my name. I'm Haran Joe, the chemistry bro. I would be happy to take you guys on a tour of some more periodic trends. Now using our newly learned skills on the effect of nuclear charge, I will now explain atomic radius. The atomic radius is very easy to understand. It is quite literally a measure of the radius or the size of the atom. The size includes the nucleus, which contains the protons and neutrons, and the surrounding electrons. Well, since the elements are arranged in the order of increasing protons, we can assume that the nucleus also increases in size across the table due to the number of protons being added to it. Thus, the positive charge increases in the nucleus, causing the electrostatic attraction of the nucleus to also increase. And therefore, the valence electrons which are floating around the atom are pulled closer and closer to the nucleus as we grow across the period due to the increasing strength of the nucleus. Now to the downward trends of the atomic radius in the periodic table. Something that you need to understand is when you move down a group, more energy levels are being added onto the atom. And just like putting on more layers of clothes will make you become larger and larger like a snowman. Hence, the atomic radius increases going down a group. So now that you understand what atomic radius is and the trends found in the periodic table, let's see how we can calculate it. We can imagine the atoms are circles with the nucleus in the center and the electrons around it. But unlike an actual circle, the radius of an atom is not fixed and it can fluctuate. So, the way to measure the radius of the atom is by having the distance between the nuclei of the two touching atoms. Interestingly, the same atom could be found to have a different radius depending on what was around it. The left hand diagram shows bonded atoms. The atoms are pulled closely together and so the measured radius is less since their orbitals overlap. The right hand diagram shows what happens if the atoms are just touching. The attractive forces are much less and the atoms are essentially unsquashed. This measure of atomic radius is called the van der Waals radius. Now that we know about atomic radius, how about the radius when the element is an ion instead? Ions are charged atoms created by the loss or gain of electrons, but with the same name and same number of protons and neutrons. A cation, a positive ion, has less electrons than a neutral atom, whereas an anion, a negative ion, has more electrons than a neutral atom. With less or more electrons, the ratio between the proton and electrons change, and thus the radius, or should I say the ionic radius, of the ion will be different than its original atom. Care to explain, Harnjo, the chemistry bro? But I only know about atomic radius, not ionic radius. Ellenly, the chemistry fairy can help. I can explain ionic radius. Well, let us begin with cations, the positive ions. Since cations have less electrons than the original atom, a cation has a smaller ionic radius than a neutral atom of the same element. Since its protons to electrons ratio is unbalanced, in which there are more protons than electrons, the effect of nuclear charge is greater, making the radius smaller. Furthermore, an energy level could have been removed when forming the cation. On the other hand, an anion has greater ionic radius than a neutral atom of the same element. When you add an electron, there is more repulsion. Electrons will spread out more and increase the ionic radius. Also, you could have added an extra energy level, which also increases the radius. As a result of this, when you go across a periodic table from lithium to carbon, the ionic radius will decrease in which more electrons are taken out while more protons are present, resulting in a larger effective nuclear charge for the ions across a period from lithium to carbon. The electrons become pulled in closer towards the nucleus and thus ionic radius decreases for cations across a period. Wow! I didn't realize these periodic trends could be so interesting. Chemistry is interesting. And now that we have properly laid out the foundations, we can get into even more exciting trends like ionization energy. Ionization energy is the energy required to remove an electron from a gaseous atom in its ground state to form a gaseous cation. The electron removed does not have to be a valence electron, but generally the valence electrons are the electrons being removed because they are the electrons which are the most likely held by electrostatic forces of attraction between the nucleus and that electron. Ionization energy depends on effective nuclear charge, distance between the electron and the nucleus, shielding produced by lower energy levels, and the pairing and repairing of electrons in orbitals. The first ionization energy is the energy required to remove the most loosely held electron from one mole of gaseous atoms to produce one mole of gaseous atoms, each with a charge of 1 plus. They are measured in kilojoules per mole and vary in size from 381, which you would consider very low, up to 2370, which is very high. 
The equation that represents the first ionization energy is in which E represents the first ionization energy in kilojoules per mole. Generally, as you go from left to right of a period, the first ionization energy increases. This is because as you go across, the effective nuclear charge increases and atomic radius decreases, as we previously explained. High effective nuclear charge means electrons, including the valence electrons, which are generally the most loosely held electrons, are strongly attracted to the nucleus. A small atomic radius means that the distance between the valence electrons, which are generally the most loosely held electrons, and the nucleus is small. High effective nuclear charge and low atomic radius equate with higher ionization energies. We can compare ionization to two people hugging. When one person hugs another person, the attraction between them is very strong, and secondly, the people are very close to each other so that they can have a tighter hold on each other, which makes it hard to separate them. This is similar to how when there is a strong attraction between electrons and the nucleus, which is dictated by a nuclear charge, and the distance between the nucleus and the electrons is low, which is dictated by atomic radius, then it takes a lot of energy to remove the electron from the atom. The second trend observed is that going down a group, first ionization energy decreases. This makes a lot of sense because effective nuclear charge decreases going down a group, atomic radius increases. Not only that, but there are many core electrons which cause shielding and forces the outer shells of electrons, especially the valence electrons, to be further from the nucleus and more loosely held. Because the attraction between the nucleus and valence electrons decreases, the valence electrons are far from the nucleus and the core electrons cause shielding between the nucleus and outer electrons, decreasing the effect that the nucleus has on outer electrons, including the valence electrons. This means that less energy is required to remove an electron. Following the analogy of hugging, low ionization energy is like two people looking for other people in a crowd. The two people look for each other because they have some attraction towards each other, but there's a lot of distance between them, and there are many people between them causing shielding. Because the attraction is low, they are far apart, and there are many people in the way of the attraction, so it is very easy for one of the people to be taken away by a friend. Now wait, why does group 3 have lower first ionization energies than group 2? And why does group 6 have lower first ionization energies than group 5? We just said that first ionization energies increase going from left to right, so why is there this dip? As mentioned earlier, ionization energy also depends on the pairing and impairing of electrons in orbital. So to explain the exceptions of group 3 and group 5, we must look at the electron shell configuration. Group 3 has one electron in the p orbital which is higher energy than the s orbital. Therefore, it requires less energy to remove the first electron in a p orbital than to remove an electron from a filled s orbital in the case of group 2. For group 6, the general configuration is ns2 np4. After all that 3p orbitals have been filled up by single electrons, which is 100 sure, the 4th p must be paired up. The electron repulsion makes it easier to remove the outermost paired electron. Therefore, it requires less energy to remove the paired electron than a single electron. I have one more periodic trend to teach you. The trend of electron affinity. If ionization energy was the energy needed to remove an electron, then electron affinity is the complete opposite. Electron affinity is the energy released when one mole of gaseous atoms each acquire an electron to form one mole of gaseous ions. This is more easily seen in symbol terms. So the first electron affinity is represented by this equation, where E represents the energy released per mole of X when this change induced by the electron takes place formally announced as the first electron affinity. Because there is a release of energy, therefore this is an exothermic reaction, and the E is a quantitative amount of how much energy is released. For example, the first electron affinity of chlorine is negative 349 kilojoules per mole. All first electron affinities have negative values, meaning that all first electron affinities are exothermic in which energy is released. Furthermore, first electron affinity has a trend that is very similar to that of ionization energy, as it also has to do with the effective nuclear charge in the atomic radius. Going across a period from left to right, electron affinity increases. This is because of the high effective nuclear charge and low atomic radius, which equate to high ionization energies. These two factors contribute to an atom's tendency to attract electrons, and so if this tendency is high, a lot of energy will be released. And going down a group, first electron affinity decreases due to the decreasing effective nuclear charge, increasing atomic radius, and increased shielding. These factors decreases an atom's tendency to attract electrons, and therefore, little energy will be released. 
the second electron affinity and everything beyond is like the first. The only difference is that the second and each successive electron affinity is endothermic, while first is exothermic, meaning that each successive ionization energy after the first requires more and more energy to take place. And this is because of the repulsion between the electrons. Since electrons have already been added, adding more electrons will result in even more repulsion. And the second ionization is when we start to observe that the force of repulsion must be overcome to add an electron to the negatively charged ion. The second electron affinity and every successive electron affinity can be expressed using this equation. Keeping in mind that the charge on the product X is negative the number of electron affinity reactions that have taken place. So for the second, it is 2 minus. Also, it is important to note that E is now on the reactant side with an addition sign because now energy is needed for the reaction to take place instead of being released, suggesting the instability that occurs from successive electron affinities. Wow, that was awesome! Are those all the trends? Nope. There's still one more, and probably the most important. It dictates the tendency of an atom to attract a bonding pair of electrons. Last but not least, Here's electronegativity. Most commonly used, the Pauling scale assigns values of electronegativity to each element. Fluorine, the most electronegative element, is assigned a value of 3.98, and values range down to francium, which is the least electronegative at 0.7. Normal gases are generally assigned a value of 0, since they don't usually form covalent bonds, except for krypton and xenon, under certain conditions. If you just remember that fluorine has the highest value, it makes everything easier to remember because everything increases towards it. This is because going towards fluorine, there's the smallest atomic radius and the highest effective nuclear charge, characteristics that are favorable for attracting electrons. Electronegativity is important because it dictates whether bond is polar or not, and polarity is very important when taking compound's properties, but we'll save that for another day. Wow, that was so interesting. I learned so much about the wonders of the periodic trends. Although I've learned the five basic trends of effective nuclear charge, atomic radius, ionization energy, electron affinity, and electronegativity, how can I apply them to the transition metals? I know the trends of atomic radius decrease along a period as a result of effective nuclear charge, but does it do the same for transition metals? For example, if one was to look at the addition of electrons in transition metals, electrons are being added to the 3D shell rather than the 4S valence shell. Just look at the electron configuration from scandium to zinc. The 4s shell remains at 4s2, with one electron added to the 3d shell. Will this have any effects on the periodic trends of these d-block elements? Alan Leek, the chemistry fairy, I need you again. Well, Gus Van, the chemistry man, as you've already recognized, in terms of transitional metals, electrons are being added to the 3d shell, or in other words, are being added to the core, rather than the 4s valence shell. But before we proceed, let's first define d-block elements in transitional metals, because although those terms are used interchangeably at times, they have slightly different definitions. D-block elements refer to the elements in the periodic table which correspond to the D-levels filling, so the blue in this photo. But transition metals are metals which form one or more stable ions which have unfilled D orbitals. So following the definition of a transition metal, not all d-block elements are transition metals. For example, group 3b, like scandium, and group 2b, like zinc, are not considered transition metals. Okay, now let's get back to explaining the trends. Since the properties of any transitional metal, or all elements whatsoever, are controlled by the valence shell rather than its core, with no change in the valence shell, the properties will remain fairly constant across the period. Explaining this in more scientific terms, as you go across the transitional metals, there will be an increase in protons, which one would expect to result in a larger effective nuclear charge. However, as mentioned previously, every additional electron in the 3D shell will inevitably result in shielding to the 4s shell, which will also allow for a constant effective nuclear charge across the period. This consistency explains why the properties are so similar. Although transitional metals do share similar periodic trends, there's still a small difference in the five main trends that we always look at. Beginning with the atomic radius, or the metallic radius, it decreases ever so slightly going across the period as a result of an increase in protons which brings in the only two valence electrons insignificantly close together. As mentioned before, as a result of the shielding brought by the 3D shell, the newfound protons cannot decrease the metallic radius any further. The same trend and principle applies to the ionic radius. Furthermore, there is a general, though irregular, increase in the first ionization energy from titanium to copper. 
the electron removed in ionization, although always removed from the same subshell, is progressively more tightly bound because although it is more partially shielded, as mentioned before, there is an increasing nuclear charge, therefore holding the electron more tightly together. And to conclude, there is a slight general increase in electronegativity from titanium to copper since this not only parallels the decreasing atomic radius, but with the stronger effective nuclear charge, although very small, will be more likely to attract a bonding pair of electrons. Wow, I learned so much about transfer transition metals. Who would have thought that transition metals shared similar physical trends? Thank you so much, Eleni the Chemistry Fairy and Haranjo the Chemistry Bro. It was, it our, was pleasure. our pleasure. We'll see you next time on the Gus Family Chemistry Man Show. Thanks for watching.